yourself with love, which binds us together in perfect harmony. You've got to start becoming intentional with how you view yourself and what you allow into your life, which means I'm a forgiving person with other people. And you stop right there and you start praying blessings over the very person you are bitter about. I'm not a jealous person. I've got so much favor in my life. God blesses me everywhere I go, everywhere I walk. I'm blessed in my coming. I'm blessed in my going. I walk in abundance. When you got these insecurities in your life, oh, no, no, no. I am chosen. I am called. I am loved. I have a plan for my life. God's got something for me. you got to start changing what you're saying and believing, and you got to immediately clothe yourself with what God wants for you. Man, I am pumped and excited you guys are here today. Man, I just got so much anticipation God's going to speak and move in your lives. I'm also pumped and excited about everybody watching live online. Can we welcome our online family? What's going on, family? Looking good today. Guys, we're closing out a series called Who Am I? But before I jump in, let me share a little, little bit. Next week, I'm kicking off a brand new series called Mountain Moving Faith. I'm telling you right now, I'm going to be preaching about how you can see the impossible become possible through God. You're going to start seeing some breakthroughs in your life. You're going to start seeing God do some amazing, miraculous things. I'm believing it. I just, I already got this anticipation. So you're not going to want to miss this series. And here's what, here's the, maybe you got a vacation scheduled, you're probably going to re reschedule it. Okay. I'm just putting it out there. That's how much anticipation I got for the series. I'm excited to preach that for you and really share my heart on mountain moving faith. Second, if you've already signed up for an, a life group, we've been doing life group lineups the last several weeks. If you've already signed up for a life group, we got the big life group kickoff event tonight here at the church at 5 p.m. for everybody that signed up for a life group. So don't miss it. It's going to be amazing. I can't wait to really kick off a powerful life group semester tonight with you guys. All right, guys, we're closing out our series, Who Am I? I, it is a series that's very special to me. Why? Because it's based around my brand new book. Who am I? If you haven't gotten this book, I don't know what you're waiting for. You can go get it. It's right out there in the lobby, so go grab a copy. But if you have gotten the book, thank you so much. And I'm just so incredibly blessed by how many people are reaching out to me and, and just all the kind words and people that stop me in the lobby and ask me to sign their book. I'm honored to. If you want me to sign your book, I'll sign it. It really does mean the world to me. And I'm blessed by everybody that's went on Amazon and, and rated and reviewed it. And a lot of people have put some really kind words on. So thank you for that. And you don't even have to buy it on Amazon to rate and review it. So if you've got a copy and God's blessed you with it, go on Amazon, rate and review it because it really means the world to me and it really blesses me and it helps it get the reach out there a little bit more. But I titled the book, Who Am I? Because that's the age-old question we all ask ourselves. Who am I? Everything from these, uh, these people, these, these philosophers of the past, asking it all the way to present times. Who am I? What's the reason we exist? What's the meaning of life? And so we've been talking about what that means. And a lot of us have the wrong view of our identity because we've been looking at ourselves through the lens of an imperfect world. We've been looking at ourselves through the pain we've experienced. We've been looking at ourselves through the sin that we've experienced from other people and the hurt they've caused us, or maybe we've been looking at our lives through what we've caused hurt to others through our sin. We have this incorrect view of ourselves, and it's robbed us of our God-given identity. Not only do a lot of us not know who we are, but like I talked about last week, a lot of us walk in this insecurity. We don't think we're good enough to even receive it. We don't think we're good enough to move beyond where we're at. And so we've settled for a life we were never intended to live. And we believe the lie to keep us in a prison of our deception. And we continue to live in that revolving door of hurt, pain, regret, move, hurt, pain, regret, it's just over and over and over and over again in our lives. And we think that's just the life for us. And so the last two weeks, I've talked a lot about identity. I've talked a lot about your insecurities. And I want to close this out with talking about your inheritance. You are called to receive a beautiful, powerful inheritance and authority from God. And not only were you called to receive an inheritance from God, you are called to pass that inheritance on. 
you are meant to leave a legacy. You are meant to have a purpose in this life. You are meant to make a difference. And I know as I say those words, a lot of people will let that go one, in one ear and out the other. Because you're going to think that's a broad statement. And you'll think, well, for some people that may be the case. For some people, I can see that they have a legacy and they're supposed to have an inheritance and they're supposed to leave an inheritance and make it. But that's not really for me. And you will believe the lie that you don't have anything to offer. You'll believe the lie you can't really do much. You will believe the lie that that's just for the select few and you're not one of those select few. And who do you think wants you to believe that lie? The father of lies. Who do you think wants you to wallow in your pity and walk in your insecurity and keep the chains upon your wrist and your feet? The very one that wants to keep you in bondage because here's what the devil knows. The devil knows that when you walk in your God-given identity, you walk in this life with purpose. And when you walk in this life with purpose, you walk in a fulfillment and you walk in a contentment in your spirit and you understand the joy that cometh every morning. And the devil understands when you walk in your identity and the inheritance given to you and the purpose of God, you can navigate through a sinful fallen world with the authority of heaven and the power of heaven. And you can walk through it in prosperity and abundance and you can see God work all things to good for those that love him. He don't want you to walk in that. So what does he do? He tells you you don't got what it takes. Settle. Live a life you're never to, supposed to live. And most people never receive the inheritance that Jesus gave us. When you receive the forgiveness of Jesus, you are given an inheritance. Romans says God adopts you as his children, sons and daughters. And not only does he adopt you as his children, but you become an heir with God and a co-heir through Christ because of the death and resurrection of Jesus. Which means there's an authority bestowed upon you. Which means you are a citizen of heaven. Which means you walk with the authority as an ambassador of heaven. Jesus, when he's speaking with the disciples, said something so crazy profound. He said it like this. I tell you the truth, anyone who believes in me will do the same works I've done and even greater works. Because I'm going to be with the Father. Get that. Jesus said, anyone, anyone, not just the select 12 he was speaking to. He said, anyone who believes that I am the Messiah, I am the Savior, I am the Son of God, will receive an inheritance, and you'll do the same works as me and even greater works. And some people go, you mean I'm going to be greater than Jesus? No, that's not what he's saying here. What he's saying here is I only spent three years on this earth doing earthly ministry. You're going to spend decades walking in the inheritance walking in that. You're going to do the things that I did on this earth and then there's going to be some crazy other heavenly things that's going to happen because you're going to spend all this time walking your inheritance because it's given to all those who believe in me. And you say, well, yeah, I can see Jesus doing that. Jesus was God. I'm not God. No, you're not God. Sometimes we think we God, but we're not God. Okay, I get that. But you forget what Philippians said. Philippians says, though he was God, Jesus, he left his divine authority in heaven. He left that divine privilege in heaven to be born like a man, which means he was fully God, but chose to be fully man on this earth and walk this earth like me and you. That's why the Bible says he went through every temptation you went through, yet he did not sin, which means I came to this earth, Jesus says, to experience what you experience and model the life you can live. Why? Because the Holy Spirit indwelled in me, remember when he was baptized, and from that day on, I walked in the power and the authority of the Holy Spirit, and you can too. That's why he makes the statement, I'm going to be with the Father. I'm leaving, because two chapters later, you notice what he says. In fact, it's best that I go away, because if I don't, the advocate won't come, and if I do go away, I'll send him to you. So what Jesus is saying, you're going to do even greater works than me, it's because there's an inheritance being bestowed upon you when you receive the understanding of my death and resurrection the Holy Spirit will indwell in you and you can walk with the authority that I walked in on this earth because I modeled it for you beforehand 
you can walk with the authority and the inheritance of God. That's why Jesus said in the Great Commission, if you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, there's power, divine anointing, a divine power. Now the question is, what do you do with that divine power? Do you just absorb it? Do you go from stadium to stadium to stadium just to chase the goosebumps? Do you use it just for selfish gains? No, he says, you're going to receive power, and what are you supposed to do? Go out and be my witnesses. Go out and leave a legacy. Go out and be inheritance givers and pour into other people. Be a disciple maker. Go out and pour your life into other people. And he says, I want you to go to Jerusalem, through Judea and Samaria, and the ends of the earth. I want you to do it in your city, in your nation, and to the world. I want you to go out and be the inheritance givers you're called and created to be because you've received an inheritance and authority from God, and you're not supposed to just take it with stingy hands. You're supposed to give it with selfless hands. You were given an inheritance. And so many of us don't believe that. So many of us live based on the laws of this cursed world. And we settle for a life we were never intended to be. You live like sons and daughters of this world instead of sons and daughters of God. And you live based on the laws of this world. And you live based on the rationality of this world. It's why I love what Paul says when he's talking about the Holy Spirit... Holy Spirit produces love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Watch this. There's no law against these things. That when you walk in the nature of the Holy Spirit, when you walk in surrender to the authority of the Holy Spirit, when you walk as a child of God, an heir to God, and a co-heir through Christ, there is no law in this cursed world that can override the promises of God. Which means there is no poverty, there is no affliction, there is no oppression, there is no addiction that can override the promises of God and the laws of God. We don't live by the laws of this world world. We live by laws of heaven. We speak it. We proclaim it. We pour it into it. And we literally live as heirs to God and co-heirs to Christ because that's what we're intended to live like. We are called to live with that authority. And not only are you called to live with that authority, listen to me, you're called to be a father and a mother, spiritually and physically. And you're called to pour into other people. And guess what? Who do you think knows that you are called to have an inheritance? The very thief that wants to steal, kill, and destroy your inheritance. The very thief that wants to get into your heart and mind and tell you, you don't have what it takes. And you're never going to be different. And guess what? That's for some people. It's not for you. Or that's just wistful thinking. The very person that knows you're supposed to be a father and mother, spiritually and physically. And if he can get you to walk in pessimism and doubt and negativity and live below your calling, guess what he'll call you to do? He'll call you and convince you to pass that on to the people that you pour into. You'll disciple pessimism. You'll disciple negativity. You'll father and mother from a place of not abundance, but of scarcity. And that's exactly what he wants you to do. He does not want you to live, live, and leave a legacy. And the problem is, is many of us don't know how to be healthy fathers and mothers because we've never seen it modeled to us. We don't know what it's like to have mentors or spiritual father and mothers or even per, uh, uh, good physical fathers and mothers. And some of us grew up in a dysfunctional home. Now, let me give you a little caveat not every home is dysfunctional. You ever heard, maybe you grew up and, and you heard the statement, every family's dysfunctional. You ever heard that? Only dysfunctional families say that. <laughs> they just trying to convince you that they're normal. They're not normal, okay? Not every family's dysfunctional, right? So if you heard that, probably a good indicator you were a dysfunctional family, right? But that's not the case. But here's the reality. There is a big difference from a dysfunctional family and a good family. Huge difference. Dysfunctional parents, dysfunctional home life, and a good family. But there's also a grave difference from a good family and the perfect father. And even good family, 
good mothers, good fathers don't always know how to raise you exactly the way God would want. They still raise based on what they know or what they accumulated. And sometimes they don't teach you to walk in who you're supposed to or they don't pass down the right inheritance fully. And because so many times we have the wrong view of God through the lens of earthly parents or earthly mentors, we don't receive fully what God has for us because we don't have the perfect view of a perfect God. And that was me for so long. For so long, I didn't know what a good dad or a good mom was. I know what you saw on TV. I, I heard stories, but I didn't know what that was. And I didn't know how to be a good father. I didn't know how to be a good mentor. I didn't know how to be a good leader. I didn't know how to be a good spiritual father. I knew how to lead based on goals, and, and I knew how to lead based on directive, but I didn't know how to be a father. I didn't know how to receive it. I didn't know how to give it. But I grew up just oblivious to it. And I remember coming face to face with the reality several, several years ago. It was a pivotal moment in my life. We were showing up to a retreat several years ago who was being led by who would become my spiritual father and our spiritual mother, uh, Pastor Scott and Jenny Wilson. And it was a church planners retreat. We were starting a, a network to help church planners, is so I thought. But as Scott started on day one, he started talking about how we're not called to just launch churches. We're called to spiritually father and mother churches. And we're called to be spiritual fathers and mothers. And we're called to leave an inheritance and leave an anointing and leave a legacy. And he starts speaking through this. And he starts speaking how most of us don't understand how to do that because we don't know how to receive from God perfectly. And a lot of that's because we've accumulated wounds from our childhood or from mentors in our lives. And so it's distorted our view of God. And Scott starts sharing his story of his father. And he says, I had a good father, but I didn't have a perfect father. And even a good father can wound you. And he said, I, I grew up living out of those wounds. And as he's speaking, in my mind, I'm thinking, I mean, I know my parents had their issues, but none of that affected me. Right? Like, I, I, I didn't get affected by having bad family life, right? And if you read the book, you'll, you'll go, how did you go through what you went through and you didn't think you had some issues, right? <laughs> but in my mind, I'm thinking, I got a good marriage. I got good kids. I have, quote, unquote, a phenomenal job. I'm living the American dream. I'm successful on paper. Like, I got out of that, and I got out of that without any residue from that pain in my past. But what I didn't know is wounds love to hide themselves and mask themselves. They just... We put band-aids over our wounds and we think if we don't see them, they heal. But how many people know if you don't let them ex be exposed to air, they never heal. If you don't let them be exposed to God, they never fully become healed. And as they started going through every single couple, share about your family, all of a sudden I started realizing, why is none of their families like my family? Why am I experiencing things nobody else experienced? And when it got to me, I made this statement. I don't know how to be a father because I don't even know what it's like to be a son. I don't know what it's like to receive from a father. I don't know what it's like to even be a child. I was reading a book several years ago by John Eldridge. It's Fathered by God. And John says every boy goes through stages if he's going to progress in health. He says a boy goes from being a boy to a cowboy goes from a cowboy to a warrior. He goes from a warrior to a lover, goes from a lover to a king, and goes from a king to a sage. That's the, the healthy progression. And then he makes this quote, and I wrote this in the book. If you read it, you've probably already seen this. But it says, great damage is done if we ask a boy to become a king too soon, as is the case when a father abandons his family. Walking out the door with parting words, you're the man of the house now. A cruel thing to do, and an even more cruel thing to say, for the boy has not yet become a man. Not yet learned the lessons of boyhood and then young manhood. He has not yet been a warrior nor a lover, and he is no way ready to become a king. As I read those words, I remember just tears rolling down my face because nothing more resonated with my life than that paragraph right there. Because I know exactly those words being spoken over me. You're the man of the house now. I was the oldest child by far. 
And my dad didn't leave our family physically, but he did leave our family because he worked. He didn't leave our home leaving my mom. He left our home because he worked. And my dad was home maybe four days a month on a good month. Some, day, some months he wouldn't come home at all because he was working. Some months he would get in fights with my mom and he wouldn't call or come home for several months. We didn't hear from my dad for multiple months. And I remember him telling me, you're the man of the house. You take care of the house while I'm gone. And I remember a real pivotal moment. I remember I was in second grade. And my mom calls me in the living room. She says, let's go outside. And she took me to our 80s roper riding lawnmower, right? These things are like big old mammoths. They make smart cars look even smaller. They're huge like little tractors. And she says, get on it. I get on it. She says, this is how you start it. This is how you stop it. This is how you get it to go. She goes, mow the grass. In second grade, man, I'm like, whoo! It's like a bang, and I'm like taking it around like it's a go-kart. I'm knocking down clotheslines. I'm running over everything. I'm zipping around, hitting boom, rocks, bam, 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 right? But it was fun. And that was like a pivotal mantle passing moment. You're the man of the house now. And that became the trend. All the manly responsibilities, that was my job. But the sad reality is I didn't have a father to teach me these manly responsibilities. I just had to learn them out on my own. And there's nothing wrong with doing chores. That child should do chores. It's more the weight that was put upon me. Because not only was I meant to do the manly responsibilities, I was also supposed to be the emotional void that my mom was missing in her life. So when my mom was going through her manic episodes, I'm the one she cried to. When she was dealing with my dad, I'm the one that consoled her and dealt with that. When she was dealing with fighting with another boss and losing another job or fighting with a family member or dealing with another friend, I'm the one that consoled her and defended her. And we moved a lot. I told you we went to 12 different schools. Well, most of the time we moved, it's because my mom would get into a fight with someone and we would, quote unquote, go to a new city to start over. I'm the one that loaded up the U-Haul. My dad was never there. I'm the one that packed up our homes and I'm the one that unloaded our homes and established a new home. I was the man. I'm the one that consoled my mom when we dealt with financial issues. I'm the one that answered the phone to screen for the bill collectors and keep the secrets that she begged me to keep from my father so he would never find out. I'm the one that started working at 14 years old and started giving to my mother financially and providing in the home to help them. I'm the one that bore that weight. And on top of that, it was my responsibility to be the father figure to my brother and sister who are many years younger than me. I was called to be that. Childhood took a side, and I became the man of the house. I remember when my brother was like 18 or 19, he was so angry at me. He starts screaming at me. He goes, you abandoned me. You abandoned me. And he says I abandoned him, and what he's referencing is that I went to college and I got married. And then he says next, you never taught me to be a man because I was his father in his eyes. It's a cruel thing to put on someone. He never yelled those words at my father. He only yelled those words at me because I was the father figure in his life. It's a cruel thing for my parents to put on me. It's a cruel thing to, for them to put on my brother. And I didn't know what it was like to actually go from a boy to a cowboy to a warrior to a lover to a king. I went straight from boy to king. And because of that, I was very independent. I didn't need nobody. I worked on my own. I took care of myself. I moved out of the house when I was 17 years old. I paid for the way I ate. I paid for my bill, bills. I supported myself. I got married very young. I never asked for anything. I worked for everything. I didn't know how to receive from people. I didn't know how to receive from mentors. I didn't know how to receive from father figures. I didn't know how to receive from anyone. If I wanted something in life, I worked for it. I made it happen. I did it from the sweat of my brow, and I didn't need no one. I was independent. I was the man. And so much so, I became so robotic with God, I didn't even know how to receive from God. I didn't know how to have a connection with God. God, I just needed God just to forgive me of my sins. Past that, I took care of business on my own, God. I don't need you to carry my burdens. I don't need you to help me out. I don't even need you to give me my dreams. I'll give my dreams myself. I'll work myself. I'll carry the stress myself. I will carry the burden. I didn't know. It's hard to receive from a heavenly father if you don't know how to receive from an earthly father. And some of you know exactly how that feels. 
Because you only need Jesus to get you into heaven. Past that, you don't know what it's like to have a relationship with him day in and day out. You don't know what it's like to cast your cares and burdens upon him. You don't know what it means to have the peace beyond understanding because you've built yourself to think you can do it all alone. And because of that, you've lost the inheritance that you were called to receive. Paul says so powerfully in Acts, he says it like this, and now I entrust you to God and the message of his grace that is able to build you up and give you an inheritance with all those he set apart for himself. Paul says, when you receive the forgiveness of Jesus and the grace of Jesus and God sets you apart as forgiven and as his child, he says there's an inheritance you're receiving. And so many of us never live on this inheritance. We never receive this abundance. We never receive all the blessings of God. We live bankrupt when we're supposed to spiritually prosper. But then watch what Paul says. Paul says, when you actually understand this inheritance and you actually understand what you receive, he says, let me show you what you do with it. Because Paul goes, I've received this inheritance. And watch what Paul says next. He says, I've never coveted anyone's silver or gold or fine clothes. Why? Because I've gotten so much from God. I've received an inheritance. You know that these hands of mine have worked to supply my own needs and even the needs of those who are with me. I have been a constant example of how you can help those in need by working hard. You should remember the words of the Lord Jesus. It is more blessed to give than receive. Did you see what happened here? He goes, because I've received an inheritance, I can't help but use that inheritance to pour into other people, to leave a legacy, to spiritually father other people, to disciple and mentor other people. I can't help but pass my inheritance on to other people and encourage you. And then he makes this statement, it's more blessed to give than receive. Too many Christians don't know the blessing of being a giver and being generous. You've bankrupted yourself because you don't know what it's like to live with this inheritance that you get to give away and you can't outgive God and you can't outpour God. You don't know what it's like to be a cup overflowing that you just keep pouring your life into other people. You keep trying to hold with greedy hands all that God has given you and you wonder why you feel bankrupt inside because you're not living your calling. You're not living as a mentor, as a spiritual father and mother. You're not pouring your life into other people, and sooner or later, you will become stale. Bible says very clearly, you cannot put new wine in an old wineskin. And we've got a lot of Christians that are old wineskins because they've hoarded, and now you have stale, tainted anointing in your life because you haven't poured it in the lives of other people. It reminds me of the story of, from my favorite movie. It's a trilogy series. How many people love Lord of the Rings? Come on, I love some Lord of the Rings, right? That's my favorite, I watch them all the time. Extended version, you let me sit through 12 hours of it, I'm in happy, okay, I love it. And I love the character Strider. Strider is this ranger that hides in the shadows but he's really a man named Aragorn. He's a man that actually has a specific calling. He's a, he's a man that's supposed to be the heir to Gondor, the king of Gondor that's, that will unite all of mankind and bring unity and bring health to Middle Earth. He's a man that has a deeper calling, but he's so insecure. He lives based on his past pain. He lives based on his insecurity. He lives based on the failures of his parents and those elders before him, and he's hiding who he's supposed to be. And in the last movie, The Return of the King, he stands before the elfish king Elrond as they're gathering armies to fight against the evil Sauron. And as he stands before Elrond, Elrond does something crazy. In this moment of it, he exposes the sword of Narsal. He takes it out of its sheath. It's the very sword that years and years ago, generations ago, sliced the hand and the ring off the finger of Sauron. It's the sword that symbols the king of Gondor and the heir to the throne. And he takes this sword and he hands it to Aragorn. And he says so clearly, he says, 
remove, get away from the ranger and become who you're called and created to be. Quit and discard that fake identity. Quit running in your insecurities. Quit running from your calling and embrace who you're called and created to be. And I feel like that's exactly what Paul, when he's writing these words to us so many times, he's saying, quit living a fake identity. Quit living less than. Quit hiding from your inheritance as an heir, as a child of God, as a son and daughter. He says, discard this identity this world's given you. Discard the identity of your pain and your failures, and your path, and become who you were called and created to be. You were called to be fathers and mothers. You were called to leave an inheritance. You were called to leave a legacy. It reminds me of the prophecy in Malachi, the Old Testament. Look, I'm sending you the prophet Elijah. He's speaking about when the days of Jesus comes, there will be a prophet i.e. John the Baptist, that will proclaim the way of Jesus. Watch this. Before the great and dreadful day of the Lord arrives. It's a great day because Jesus is coming. It's a dreadful day because not everybody will receive Jesus. So many people will miss the inheritance of Jesus. His preaching will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers. He's speaking about there will become a new anointing on the children of God. And no longer will you live for yourself, but you'll be called to be inheritance bearers. You'll be called to be fathers and mothers. And you'll have those that are younger in their faith become children, sons and daughters underneath your leadership. And you'll pull an inheritance into them. There is a spirit of Elijah. And what is the spirit of Elijah? Well, if you don't know the story of Elijah, Elijah is one of the greatest prophets. I love Elijah. Elijah is one dude, man. He, didn't, he did the craziest things. Like Elijah, like, stood in front of the king, and he was like, dude, you acting a fool. You ain't following God. You are messing it up. There's going to be great famine in this. Life. God's going to curse this place. Like, he didn't care about his life. He knew God had him. There's a moment when he's with his apprentice, and his apprentice, had, there's this, this enemy army coming after him, and the apprentice is freaking out. He's like, oh my gosh, Elijah, look outside. The armies are there. And Elijah looks at him and goes, there's more of us than them. And the apprentice is like, uh, one, two, lots of them. Like, you got Jerry Jones, right? You got Jerry Jones math, right? One plus one, three, right? What's that? And he goes, open his eyes. And he opens his eyes, all of a sudden, the armies of God are all surrounding them, right? This is a dude that saw the armies of God. He went and, and saw famine, was fed by ravens and, and protected, did miracles of widows. He went and stood upon a mountain in front of hundreds of false prophets and called fire down from heaven and destroyed all these false prophets. He, he saw the, the drought in through prayer and, and torrential rains. I mean, it's crazy miracles. And then all of a sudden, Jezebel, the queen, says, I'm going to kill you because you killed my false prophets. And the Bible says he ran in fear. So much so that he's crying for God to take his life. He's depressed and crying for God to end his life. And then God has this conversation with him, and he calls him to the mountain. And watch what God says. What are you doing here, Elisha? Why are you running? Why are you living like this? Why do you want your life to end? And Elijah replied, I've zealously served the Lord God Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down your altars, killed every one of your prophets. I'm the only one left, which we later know there's 7,000 faithful people in the nation at this time. And now they're trying to kill me too. Then the Lord told him, watch this, go back the same way you came. Travel to the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive there, anoint Hazel to be king of Aram. Then anoint Jehu, grandson of Nemesh, to be king of Israel. And anoint Elisha, or some say Elisha, son of Shaphat, from the town of Abel, to replace you as my prophet. Do you see what he's doing? He's saying, you're saying there's no prophets left, and you're trying to kill you. And he's looking at him and going, why haven't you raised anybody up? Why haven't you anointed other people? Why haven't you fathered and left an inheritance and left a legacy? And he says, you've done some great miracles, but you missed your greatest calling. Go back where you came and do your job. 
Go back and anoint. Go back and disciple. Go back and mentor. Go back and father. Go back and be who you're called to be. And he anoints Elisha and he mentors and fathers Elisha. And then all of a sudden, Elisha, towards the end of Elisha's life, have this connection. Watch this. When they came to the other side, Elijah said to Elisha, tell me what I can do for you before I was taken away. And Elisha replied, please let me inherit a double share or double portion of your spirit, some say anointing, and become your successor. You have asked a difficult thing, Elijah replied. And if you see when I am taken away from you, then you will get your request. But if not, then you won't. And all of a sudden, Elisha won't leave. He's like, I want that anointing. He stays with him. Elijah keeps telling him to go away. And he's like, nope, I'm going with you. And he's going. He's following him everywhere he can. He's not leaving. He wants that anointing. And then the next thing we know, as they were walking along, talking, suddenly a chariot of fire appeared, drawn by horses of fire. It drove between the two men, separating them. And Elijah was carried by a whirlwind into heaven. Elisha saw it and cried out, my father, my father, I see the chariots and the charioteers of Israel. That's the sign. And the anointing is now put upon him. And as they disappeared from the sight, Elisha tore his clothes in distress. Elisha picked up Elijah's cloak, which had fallen when it was taken up. Then Elisha returned to the bank of the Jordan River. He struck the water with Elijah's cloak and cried out, Where is the Lord of God of Elijah? Then the river divided and Elisha went across. When the group of prophets from Jericho saw from a distance what happened, they exclaimed, Elijah's spirit rests upon Elisha. How powerful! Elijah finally did what he was supposed to. He passed an inheritance on. He, he fathered a disciple. He gave a double portion of his anointing. Such a beautiful moment. I wish the story of Elisha's life ended as happy as it started in this moment. But that's not the case. Because here's the reality. The sad reality is many of us want Elisha's anointing, just not his responsibility. So many of us want the goosebumps from God. We want God to give us his blessings. You want to have the miracles. But we just don't want the responsibility goes with the miracles. And that was Elisha. At the very end of Elisha's life, watch what happens. When Elisha was in his last illness, he's about to die, king of Joash, of Israel, visited him and wept over him. My father, my father, I see the chariots, the chariots. See what he's saying? Isn't that the exact line Elisha said when Elijah was taken away? You know what the king's saying? Who gets your anointing? Who have you fathered? Is it me? Are you going to give it to me? Are you going to pass down an inheritance? Are you going to, are you going to move? In someone's life, are you going to hand something down? And Elisha puts him to a test. He says, shoot an arrow out that represents Israel's victory. And he says, take an arrow and bang it on the ground. And the king does it three times. And he goes, why did you only do it three times? If you'd done it five times, you would have had enough faith to win the entire war. You just have enough faith to win a battle. And then all of a sudden, he's, just a few verses later, watch this. Elisha died and was buried. That's it. No great conclusion, no mantle passing moment. Elisha has this moment with the king. The king's asking him, Who's your inheritance bearer? Who your pastor your legacy? And Elisha just dies. And then the verse picks up. Groups of Moabite raiders used to invade the land each spring. Same verse. This is still verse 20. Once when some Israelites were burying a man, they spied a band of his raiders. So they hastily threw the corpse into the tomb of Elisha and fled. But as soon as the body touched Elisha's bone, the dead man revived and jumped to his feet. Isn't that crazy? Elisha's dead, rotting in a grave. And a dead man touches his bone. There's so much anointing on Elisha's body, he springs him to life and he becomes alive. I used to read that and go, man, that's so cool. He's so anointed, even when he's dead, he brings life. That's not cool at all. It's cruel. It's a tragedy. Because Elisha took his anointing to the grave with him. He died with his anointing. And too many of us die not being spiritual fathers and mothers. We die not leaving an inheritance. What if Elisha was supposed to not pass on a double portion of anointing? What if he was supposed to pass on a quadruple portion of anointing? 
And what if the man after him was supposed to pass on eight times, and then 16 times, and then 32 times, and 64 times, and 128 times, and 256 times of an anointing? What if it was supposed to multiply and multiply, passing down from generation and generation? What would our world look like if we had some kingdom inheritance bestowers and pouring in and fathering and mothering? What would this world? I'm telling you, we wouldn't need water. Washington, D.C., and we wouldn't be crying out of what's going on Fox and CNN, and we wouldn't be quibbling what's happening on social media because we would be the church. We'd be the city on a hill. We would be the light of the world. We'd be the salt of the earth. We would walk in the anointing of God. We wouldn't need man to do God's job. But here's the question that burns my spirit. Will we be inheritance hoarders or bestowers? Elrond, the elvish king, gives Aragorn the sword. And he tells him, there's not enough armies you guys have massed to beat Sauron. He says, but the man that wields this sword has an authority. He has an authority to call a certain army. It's my favorite scene in the movie. And he says, there's an army of ghosts. They're cursed men that was supposed to come to Gondor's aid, but they did not want to live to their calling. And because of that, they were cursed to forever, ever live as ghosts until they fulfilled their oath. And only the king of Gondor can release them. Only the king of the Gondor could help them release and live that oath. So he goes into the caves, and he's surrounded by the ghost army, and the ghost army with this haunting chant says the way is shut none shall pass the way is shut none shall pass and Aragorn with the sword in hand says I command your allegiance I summon you to fulfill your oath and the ghost king with this laugh and this mockery says only the king the heir to the throne of Gondor can call us to fulfill that oath. And the ghost king goes with his sword to strike Aragorn down. And as he goes to swing, Aragorn puts the sword, stops his sword midair. Panic fills the ghost king's face. And he goes, the line was broken. And Aragorn with such swag grabs him by the throat and says, it's been remade. It's a moment that, man, I just get chills. Because I know Tolkien was a believer. And he's writing such a symbolism between us and Jesus and what it means. And we have a cursed world that tells us the way has been shut. And it is no way to pass. And we've been told that this cursed world has told us the line has been broken. You will forever be cursed. You will live in a poverty mindset. You will always be oppressed. And Jesus walks through that grave three days later and says the line has been remade. I sit at the right hand of God. Come on. And I love the power and the authority of it. It reminds me of the prophecy in Ezekiel. Whenever God says, the Lord took hold of me and he carried me away of the spirit of the Lord to the valley filled with bones. He led me all around among the bones that covered the valley floor. They were scattered everywhere across the ground and were completely dried out. Then he asked, son of man, can these bones become living again? Oh, sovereign Lord, I replied, you alone can answer that. Then he said to me, speak a prophetic message to these bones and say, dry bones, listen to the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says. Look, I'm going to put breath into you and make you live again. I'll put flesh and muscle on you and cover you with skin. I'll put breath into you and you'll come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I spoke this message just as he told me. Suddenly as I spoke, there was a rattling noise across the valley. The bones of each body came together and attached themselves completely scattered. Skeletons. Then as I watched, muscle and flesh formed over the bones. The skin formed to cover their bodies, but they still had no breath in them. Then he said to me, speak a prophetic message to the winds, son of man. Speak a prophetic message and say, this is what the sovereign Lord says. 
Come, O breath from the four winds, breathe into these dead bodies so they may live again. So I spoke the message as they commanded me, and breath came into their bodies. They all came to life and stood up on their feet, a great army. I love the way Ezekiel paints this. God commanded him, speak a prophetic message from the sovereign Lord. And some of you need to speak a prophetic message into your life. You need to speak a prophetic message into your marriage, into your children, into your workplaces into your neighbors you need to speak a prophetic life into your purpose and your calling dreams that's been laid dead and dormant let the breath of God fill them rise up with purpose rise up as legacy givers rise up and be who God called and created you to be rise up and take form and let the breath of God fill your life and let me prophetically speak right into your life if you have deadness in your life if you feel dead in your spirit if you feel like it's over if you're walking in poverty if you're walking in affliction, if you're walking in a lack thereof, let me prophetically speak, dead bones rise. Dead bones rise in the name of Jesus. The king has come. The line has been remade. I get excited about this because I know the inheritance you can walk in. I know what God wants to give you, but you got to receive it. He'll never force that inheritance on you. Some of you, you've got Jesus for heaven, and that's about it. And you need to pick up your inheritance and be the sons and daughters you're called and created to be. But some of you don't know what it's like to walk in the forgiveness of Jesus at all. You don't know what it's like to walk in the freedom of Jesus. Because some of you don't have a relationship with Jesus at all. Or maybe some of you have in the past, but you've walked away and you're not living a life you're called to. And you let the whispers of this world tell you the line has been broken, the curse is won. And you need to remember in your spirit, the line has been remade because Jesus died and rose from the grave. And you may say, how do you, how do you walk in that forgiveness? It's easy. The Bible says all you need is ask forgiveness with your mouth and believe in your heart. Believe he is who he says he is. And when you pray, he responds. Sounds simple, but great, because it's not supposed to be hard. It's meant to be, grace is meant to be chosen. Your God's already chosen you. You just got to choose him. And there's some people in this room right now that needs to walk in the forgiveness and the inheritance of Jesus. So I want everybody to bow your heads. And we're looking around. Take your hand and place it over your heart, symbol of your soul. And if you're in this room right now and you need to receive the forgiveness of Jesus, I want to ask, we're praying this together as a family. You believe these words and you receive the inheritance and the forgiveness and the abundance of your God. Repeat after me, church. I believe Jesus died on the cross. Jesus rose from the grave. And Jesus' blood washes away all my sins. I am forgiven. I am chosen, I matter, and I give my life to Jesus. Holy Spirit, move right now in the name of Jesus. Holy Spirit, condemnation go in the name of Jesus. Shame has to go in the name of Jesus. And I pray right now, crowns of sons and daughters, heirs to the throne, now sit on their heads as they walk in the authority of the covenant given to them by God. I'm praying it for abundance in the name of Jesus. So right now, I'm going to ask you to do something crazy bold with every head bowed and nobody looking around. If you made that commitment today for the first time, or you recommitted your life to Jesus, I'm going to ask you to do something crazy. I'm going to ask you to raise your hand in just a second. You may say, why do you want me to do that? Because I want you to symbolically tell yourself, the line has been remade. I'm a son and daughter, and I'm not who I used to be. On the count of three, I want to see hands all over this place raised. One, don't be afraid. Two, we're going to celebrate. Three, get your hands up right now. See your hand, 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 see your hand. Thank you, Jesus. See your hand right here. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, church, get excited. Come on, you can do better than that. Dead bones rise. Thank you guys for watching. Make sure you hit that subscribe button, ring and ding that bell so you never miss a video or a live stream. And Give this a share to one of your friends. And remember, 
We go live every single Sunday. Till next time, pray God's peace.